morning is from John chapter 3 verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time from the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born first from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God not, did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Before I, is the microphone on? Is it on? Okay, oh, you, very good, thank you so much. You never know. I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to worship, <clears throat> excuse me, to worship with you this summer, to be part of this congregation as Pastor Helen and Bruce have the opportunity of renewal. It is a wonderful um, opportunity and they're going to be doing some outstanding things around the world and I pray that we will be doing ast astounding and outstanding things here at First Christian Church. Thank you for having me this summer. <clears throat> and I want to begin by saying to you, Happy Trinity Sunday, church. <laughs> Do you have on your good Trinity Sunday finery? Did you see all the ads in the newspaper today about those Trinity Sunday specials? I'm just kind of wondering what Target is going to do to celebrate Trinity Sunday. And I sure hope the weather clears up so that your plans for a Trinity Sunday picnic will be able to be seen to fruition. Now, I haven't lost my mind. Trinity Sunday, which occurs once a year on the Sunday after Pentecost, is not really a holiday, is it? I certainly didn't see it on the Google Calendar for today. But whether we find it on our calendars or captured for the retailer's benefit today is Trinity Sunday. And I really appreciated what Jan Harrington said in the newsletter, his article this week, where he offered these words about Trinity Sunday. He said, and I quote, Trinity Sunday is the culmination of the advent to Easter cycles of the church year. During the first half of the year, we have at different times celebrated the creative and active Father, or the loving and redeeming Son, or the unifying and renewing Spirit, 
always viewing the face of one but aware of the presence of the others. End of quote. That is well said. Now, for many years, when I was a pastor in the local church, I would lead the pastor's class every year. Its purpose, as I'm sure you know, was to prepare young people to make their confession of faith and to be baptized. The class included learning about Jesus, reading scriptures, learning about the church and its history, about the Christian church, disciples of Christ, and there would always come a lesson about the threefold nature of God, or as most of us would say, the Trinity. You know, that hard to explain concept of God being three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, as disciples, of course, we don't usually do much teaching about the Trinity. We don't subscribe to any doctrines, so I knew that I didn't have to dig too deep with the young people in my class. But I knew I couldn't shortchange the discussion about why our faith speaks about God as being a Father and a Son and the Holy Spirit. The material I used for the class suggested that I should compare the Trinity to an egg. Think about it. There's the shell that holds it together, and within the shell is the egg white and the egg yolk. An egg can be a physical representation of something that is three in one. Now, I know the analogy can't be taken too far because an egg is something that breaks and gets cooked and eaten and it can spoil and go rotten and smell terrible. And I didn't want to say that about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but I did appreciate the author's attempt at suggesting how it's possible to think of something that exists as a complete whole made up of three parts, each with its own separate purpose. Now I have to confess to you that understanding the Trinity has always challenged me. Jesus never said to his followers, you must believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And he never diagrammed the relationship of the three using a big triangle thing and a dry erase board and a, like a coach uses at halftime. And the Apostle Paul didn't give any instruction about the Trinity either. He never said, you must believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He never put together a PowerPoint presentation either. The early councils of the church fought mightily to, in order to name and describe the way they experienced God and read of God in Scripture. In our Gospel lesson today, Jesus encounters Nicodemus, who comes to him under cover of darkness to find out more about this teacher, who he acknowledges has come from God. In their conversation, Jesus tells Nicodemus that those who want to see the realm of God must be born from above, and those who want to enter that realm must be born of water and spirit. With these statements, Jesus comes sort of close to identifying a three-in-one relationship between God and himself and the Holy Spirit. Now the key word here is relationship. Maybe we don't actually find the word Trinity in the Bible, and maybe the idea of God in three persons is a human construct. But what the three parts of the Trinity show us very clearly is the relationship that God has fashioned between God and the world. David Lose says, quote, at the heart of our understanding of God as somehow three in one 
is the notion that you can't fully or finally understand God without talking about relationship. The very ground of that relationship, the deep, abiding, and everlasting God for the whole creation, that is what is at the foundation of this relationship, that love. Jesus says it himself just a few verses later in today's gospel. God so loved the world. God so loved the world. Now, if you listen to me very much during this summer, you're going to hear me say on many occasions and in many ways that God loves the world. It is, it's a mantra for me in my faith. And in that idea of world, I, I include me and I include you. God so loved the world, God so loves you and me. God loves the world and God shares that love. God showers the world with love. From the beginning of time when God's spirit hovered over the deep and created a world that fit together and brought forth animals and human beings, God's love was evident everywhere. And God extended that love in the covenants of relationship that God forged with people. And then when the time was right, God sent God's Son to demonstrate in word and in deed just how much God loves us and how God wanted us to live out that love with one another and with the world. And then God sent forth the Spirit to bear witness to God's ongoing love for the creation. So we begin to describe the three-in-one nature of God, and maybe we get some of it right. We can claim the love of God as the source of power and purpose in this unusual relationship of love for the world. And we can find our place within the love that God has shown as the one who creates and redeems and sustains unendingly. And having said that, I think we have to ask and try to answer the question, so what? So what does it mean to live with a God who relates as a creator and a redeemer and a sustainer. So what difference does that make in my life or your life and in the life of the world? So tomorrow morning when you wake up and get ready for your day, no matter what you have on the schedule, what impact will the three-in-one God have in your life? I would hope the impact would be <clears throat> greater than just sharing with someone at the water cooler, oh, I heard an interesting sermon at church yesterday. I would hope that you might wake up and know that you are unconditionally loved, that you have immeasurable value in God's eyes, that no matter what you do or what is done to you, and no matter where you go, God loves you and cares about you. Jesus' words to Nicodemus promised that we are all born anew through the Spirit, and we are co-heirs with him. And so we think, what decisions might you make this week knowing that you have God's unconditional love and confidence. Could that give you courage to speak up 
to make something right that has been too long exacerbating a bad situation? How might the challenges that you face at work or at school be put into perspective when you remember that you are a co-heir with Christ? Is there some creative way to reimagine an outcome that would bring peace or calm to a problem? And what kind of risks might you take in your relationships or your work, knowing that the creator and sustainer of the universe loves you and has your back? As you move through this new week, my friends, I pray that you will take with you a deep and abiding sense of God's love for you and for the whole world. I hope that you will proclaim to the world that it has been redeemed and made new through Jesus Christ. And I hope that you will embrace the living presence of God in the Holy Spirit who is with us. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, you have thought of everything, haven't you? You created the world and all that is in it. You worked with the people you created to make your relationship with them as good as it could be. And then you sent your son Jesus to show us how to live and to save us. When he ascended to heaven to be with you, you made sure we wouldn't be without your sustaining presence and guidance and you sent us your spirit to advocate for us. Thank you for your generosity and your graciousness toward us. Oh God, we pray for our world today. We lift up the people in Texas and Oklahoma and Mexico whose lives have been completely disrupted by rains and floods and tornadoes. We, would pray, we pray you would comfort the families who have lost loved ones. And we pray for those who are responding to this disaster, asking you to give them strength and courage. We pray for peace, O oh God. Too many places in our world suffer from warring madness. We pray your help be with those who are suffering at the hand of brutal conquerors. We lift up those who are sick or despondent and ask you to heal and bless them. May we be bearers of hope to those who need it. We pray for those graduating from high school, for their futures, their hopes, their dreams. And we pray also for the end of the school year for all students and teachers. Bless them with safe summers and good rest. And with the start of summer, we also pray for traveling mercies for those who will be on the road. As we turn to the start of a new week, strengthen us to be your people in the world, O oh God. Make us kind to one another and to the earth. We offer this prayer in the name and by the grace of our Lord Jesus. Amen.